Hello, and welcome to today's Aperio Foundation webinar. I'm in Dolphin, Executive Director of the Aperio Foundation, and I'll be introducing today's event. Aperio is a global community of higher ed institutions and commercial affiliates who work to develop and sustain open source software in the service of education. We act as an umbrella for currently for around 17 software communities who produce a wide range of software to support learning, teaching, and research. UPortal was one of the first communities to produce open source software for higher education. It has almost 20 calendar years of development and is widely deployed at the institutional level and above. Recent years have seen the UPortal community effect a significant transformation. It's fair to talk about UPortal as an ecosystem rather than as an application. Drew Wills is a member of the UPortal steering committee and is employed by Unicon and Perio Commercial Affiliate. Drew is going to give us an extended view of part of that UPortal ecosystem. Before handing over to Drew, please note that this webinar will be recorded and made available via the Aperio YouTube channel. You can find the address for that in the chat. Drew will be pausing for questions, but feel free to post questions into the chat and I'll do my best to collate them. And with that, over to you, Drew. Thanks very much. You bet. Thanks, Ian. Uh, I see my microphone uh, lighting up in the list of users, so I'm going to assume that I can be heard. Uh, if I if I can't if I'm not heard, I hope you will tell me. Uh, as Ian said, I'm Drew Wills. I, I work at Unicon. I uh, work in sort of the portals U portal space uh, here at Unicon. We provide a variety of uh, professional services for U portal. Uh, today we are uh, presenting uh, on sort of one topic that's that's maybe partly two topics. Uh, there's a, a very significant change, sort of a, a tectonic shift in the way we do front-end uh, development for uPortal uh, that's happening right now. Um, we are sort of reinventing uh, the way that we're doing front-end development, and I, I recognize, uh, I'd say, a majority of the names uh, that appear to have connected for this, and I think that uh, most of you have some awareness uh, of these changes already, uh, you know, certainly this isn't the first time that we've talked about them, uh, but I think it's great to keep talking about them. Uh, they really are a big deal, uh, and they offer sort of uh, tremendous advantages over the old way, uh, and we need to do our best to, you know, circulate information about them so that they can be uh, adopted, uh, accepted, and so that more folks can be successful with them. So I'm going to talk about this change in front-end development in a, in a general way. I'm going to advance to the agenda slide. I'm going to talk uh, about the, um, you know, the, the paradigm shift in front-end development for uPortal uh, in a general way, uh, and then, you know, when I've sort of covered that, I'm going to move into speaking specifically about, uh, you know, one, you know, one incarnation of, uh, you know, one new front-end component for uPortal specifically uh, called Form Builder, uh, and uh, it's, it's sort of back-end equivalent, which is FBMS. It stands for Form Builder Microservices. Uh, so we'll do sort of a general high level, and then we'll do a bit of a, a specific look at, um, at at one web component and its uh, backend, um, you know, corresponding backend. Uh, Form Builder may be, I, I think it it probably is the most uh, complicated, sort of the largest, most feature rich uh, web component that we've developed for uPortal so far. Uh, so it should be interesting that way. Uh, but before I do that, I do have, I have a few items of community news, uh, you know, just a little bit of uh, cross-promotion and uh, building awareness around things that are happen happening in the community, sort of events more than, more than code changes. Uh, so firstly, first of all, I want to mention that uh, Wednesday, uh, you know, next month, October 17th, uh, on a Wednesday, at noon um, Eastern Time, 
there will be the next installment of the of the uPortal OSS briefing. Now, OSS is a it's a Unicon program. It's it's open source support. Uh, but we do this, these briefings uh, every quarter for everyone. Uh, we have all kinds of people connect and, and listen. Uh, the, all of the content is of general interest uh, to anyone uh, running uPortal or uh, considering uPortal. Uh, we cover uh, you know, engineering updates. We, we cover community news like this, other events that are coming up, and we do spotlights uh, on implementations or on specific items of new development, and we do uh, Q&A. Uh, the briefings are, are reasonably well attended. Uh, you know, they're normally, uh, there's normally pretty good energy. We get a lot of questions, so I encourage you to come. Uh, at the bottom of this slide, I have a link to uh, recordings of previous sessions. I think there are easily um, a dozen or maybe 20 uh, previous briefing recordings uh, available on YouTube. All right, so uh, first item of community news. Uh, next uh, <coughs> item of community news, uh, uPortal Winter Summit 2019. Uh, we are <coughs> Uh, we will be holding our second annual, the, uh, the uPortal community, I mean, and the uPortal steering committee, holding our, our second annual uh, uh, uPortal Winter Summit. Uh, I'm pausing, sorry, to catch up a bit on the comments. Uh, I'm hoping that everyone can hear me well. It sounds like uh, at least many can. Uh, all right, so our second annual uh, Winter summer Summit for uPortal, uh, it will be in January, uh, and it will be held this time at the Unicon headquarters in, in sunny uh, suburban Phoenix, Arizona. Let's see. I have another slide for that. Uh, the dates are uh, January 29th. Through 31st, that's a that's a Tuesday through a Thursday. Uh, I know some folks will probably travel uh, travel in early and potentially travel back late. Uh, if you if you are in town on Monday and Friday, uh, we can at least provide you uh, a space to sit down and an internet connection, and probably uh, we can sort of mingle and and speak with you. Uh, in an unstructured way uh, during those times as well. Uh, so feel free to consider you know, coming out on, on Sunday or leaving on Friday, that's fine. Uh, this is a, a zero cost event, uh, meaning that Unicon and the uPortal Steering Committee or Aperio are not charging participants anything uh, for this event, but uh, of course there will be uh, travel costs. I think the Gilbert area uh, of, of metropolitan Phoenix is, is reasonably affordable. Uh, I can add that probably on the first day of this event, there will be a free half-day training seminar. Uh, I want to uh, emphasize that because I hope that uh, you know, the availability of this free training uh, will make uh, it easier for folks to, to, you know, to attend, easier for folks to, you know, pitch uh, attending this uh, winter seminar to their leadership. Uh, it, that will probably run for three hours, and the, the training it will be similar to this uh, webinar, uh, similar content, but it will be much more in-depth. Uh, and much more sort of hands-on or with code ex examples. Uh, it will be uPortal, you know, modern uPortal front-end development training. Uh, let's see. All right, my apologies. I was trying to, to play with the mute here. Uh, all right, uh, last item of community news. Uh, there is a, um, we are, are currently refreshing uh, the membership of the uPortal Steering Committee. Uh, 
Uh, we just went through a process where we um, you know, nominated and, and voted on uh, developer representatives. So there are three new developer representatives uh, in the ePortal Steering Committee. Uh, and can I can I ask if if you're not if you're not me, can you um, perhaps put yourself on mute, or or maybe that's something Ian can do, because uh, I'm getting I'm getting a few items of noise. Uh, we will take questions throughout in the uh, in the chat. Absolutely. Uh, at any rate, we're seeking two uh, additional community representatives. Community representatives can be anyone. We're currently taking nominations. We're taking nominations up to Monday, September 24th, 3 p.m. CST. Uh, the, you should be aware that uh, you know, community representatives will serve a two-year term. Uh, the steering committee meets monthly uh, through Google Hangouts. And uh, the steering committee primarily focuses on, on things like project health, uh, documentation for uPortal, uh, marketing uPortal and communicating to the public at large, and also handling uh, security incidents when they come up. There's maybe a couple a year. Uh, all right. So uh, that handles, uh, you know, the you know the housekeeping, the community news items. Uh, I'll start uh, with the sort of main uh, content of this webinar, uh, you know, on, on web components and ultimately one specific web component. Uh, but let's start, you know, from the 10,000 foot uh, view. You know, why why are we doing this? Uh, you know, I said there's a major change in how we do front end development for uPortal. Well, what's the, uh, what's the purpose of that? What, you know, why did we need to change or feel that we needed to change? Uh, I'll start uh, by highlighting that this is not the first change uh, that uPortal has seen. Ian mentioned that uh, uPortal has had nearly 20 years, nearly two decades of uh, continuous you know, development, uh, community development, and in that, you know, long uh, history, we have seen other significant changes in the way, um, you know, modules or, or front-end content is developed for uPortal. Uh, in the ancient days of uPortal 2.0, uh, we had, and, and for most of the 2.x line, we had a, uh, a standard for front-end content called the iChannel. Uh, the iChannel was a, a Java interface, and we it, it was a completely custom uh, concept developed by the, the uPortal developers, uh, and we built iChannels uh, for many years. Uh, the uh, you know the the Java community process introduced a standard for Java portlets. Uh, 1.0 of that standard was. JSR 168, uh, and that was, uh, you know, released in October of 2003. Uh, and, and shortly after that was released, uPortal added uh, support for Java portlets, uh, even updated that support in, in version 4.0 uh, to, to the second version of that specification. So for the majority, I'd say, of uPortal's history, we have focused on content based on Java portlets, uh, at first, uh, portlet specification one, later portlet specification two. Uh, but uh, beginning with uPortal 5, which of course released uh, October of last year, you know, so nearly a year ago, beginning with uh, uPortal 5, we have started to shift away from portlets, and I'll, I'll talk about why in a moment. Uh, but we started to shift away from portlets. Uh, initially, we were um, uh, you know, 100% focused on this concept of soffits, which is, which was, which is again, a completely uPortal custom, you know, standard for content. And and we have uh, uPortal 5.1 and uPortal 5, uh, 5.2 uh, continue support for soffits exactly as they were introduced in uPortal 5, but uh, sort of shortly after uPortal 5. We, we actually shifted, sh uh, started shifting the way we do soffits 
what we have now uh, in, in terms of the front-end development that we're doing at Unicon uh, and on behalf of uh, our clients and uh, with partners um, you know, all over the globe, uh, we are doing, we continue to use the Soffit technology that we developed for uPortal 5.0 uh, but primarily, we're using the uh, the software technology for for sort of back end uh, solutions. And in the browser, uh, in the front end, we have shifted our development to uh, web components, uh, which is the sort of central topic of this uh, webinar. Uh, so quickly, uh, a word or two about Java portlets. Why did we look, uh, you know, start to look far afield, you know, start to look away from portlets? Uh, well, um, we've talked about this a lot, and I feel like I've had many opportunities to uh, sort of bang on this drum. But, but briefly here, uh, Java portlets have a complicated life, cy life cycle that links them, that ties them tightly to a full page request and replace paradigm of web development of the last decade, uh, where every interaction that you have with the web application is a full page submit and replace. Uh, portlets have many configuration settings that, that essentially must be chosen before the, uh, the distribution is built. Uh, things like uh, the user attributes that they want to consume, the groups or roles that they're interested in, caching settings, and, th and other things like portlet events, which is a, a completely custom portlet thing. But uh, the point is that there are several uh, configuration you know, elements uh, in portlets that have to be chosen before the build is done. Uh, that makes it difficult uh, to configure it makes it very difficult to configure, um, you know, sort of portlet-based content on a per-deployment setting or a per-implementation uh, basis. Uh, we figured out ways to do it with overlays, but they're kind of kludgy and brittle. Uh, portlet URLs must be generated by a server-side API using uh, using Java. Uh, that's sort of inconvenient when we're doing most of our front-end development in, in JavaScript. Uh, it, you know, next point, very important, portlets, Java portlets must run in the same, same servlet container and the same Java process as the portal itself. And lastly, also uh, a very important point, uh, the, the Spring framework drops support for portlet MVC in version 5. Uh, uPortal and our sort of community portlets, the ones that we have and continue to maintain, are all on, on Spring Framework version 4. And that's fine for now, uh, but we can't stay on Spring uh, version 4 forever. Uh, Spring Framework version 4 will cease being supported at some point in the future that is not too far. Uh, and when that when that happens, when we move to Spring 5, there won't be the Spring Portlet MVC framework, which is how we've we've built all our portlets essentially uh, in the uPortal community. Uh, so it pays uh, to have a new strategy now and to focus on a new kind of development uh, for that reason and a, and a variety of other reasons. Uh, so introducing web components, uh, you know, for those who, who may be new to this topic, web components are a set of standards or features, you know, sort of a collection of new features uh, added to the, you know, what HTML and the DOM uh, are uh, being added by the W3C. Uh, and this collection of new features, uh, you know, aim together to support uh, reusable widgets that can be used in in web applications and in web pages. Uh, web components are, uh, you know, 100% modern, you know, sort of 100% uh, up to date and contemporary in the way they are developed. Also a uh, purely uh, front end concept. There is no, uh, you know, there's no server side rendering element of web components. You know, they run completely in the browser. Uh, they pair well with the microservices architecture. 
Uh, and this next point I think is very neat based on our experience with Java portlets. The uh, web components are, are supported directly by browsers and by W3C and, and the DOM specification. Uh, so instead of being off in, in a small sliver of the, um, you know, of the industry on our own working on, on something like Java portlets, uh, we're kind of all in this together, it's sort of everything that happens in uh, all the changes and updates and new capabilities that happen uh, in the world of developing web applications sort of apply to us as um, uh, developers uh, of, of web components. Uh, so we're, we're sort of vastly more mainstream now in the work that we're doing. Uh, also, uh, you know, web components is sort of the first genu genuinely attractive standards-based uh, replacement for Java portlets. It's, uh, it offers us a lot of, of what we look for in a standard for pluggable content, uh, you know, that we might consider adopting in uPortal, and we have considered and we uh, desire greatly to adopt in uPortal. Uh, all right. Uh, I am uh, looking at the, the chat. It seems to be mostly about audio issues. Uh, you know, my apologies for audio issues. Uh, but the, uh, that is great. I will move on uh, because I fear that um, if I'm not careful, I may sort of fall behind. Uh, all right. So uh, last section talked about uh, rationale for uh, you know, leaving portlets and looking at web components. This section uh, talks about web components in a little more depth. Uh, so web components, you know, I said it was a collection of standards. There are essentially four-ish uh, standards that primarily make up, uh, you know, the notion of web components. And they are HTML templates, uh, custom elements for HTML, uh, the shadow DOM, uh, and this you know, new feature called HTML imports. Uh, if you go to, you know, the webcomponents.org uh, website, the URL is, uh, you know, hyperlink is provided at the bottom of this slide. Uh, this is how webcomponents.org will describe, uh, you know, what web components are. Uh, in a bit, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll maybe nuance that a bit by talking about developing web components in Node.js. Uh, but this is, you know, at the level of the standards, this is, uh, in essence, what web components are about. Uh, I have the slide here, taken directly from webcomponents.org. Uh, talks about browser support uh, for for these web component standards, uh, and what you should what you should take from this is that um, is, is that things are pretty good. Uh, Web Components is a collection of new standards uh, for web development, uh, but they're not so new that they are uh, unsupported, that there isn't a way to support them. Uh, you know, browsers or uh, you know, browsers like uh, Chrome and Opera have sort of pretty ubiquitous support uh, for the features we will be discussing. Uh, and uh, HTML templates, uh, you know, the HTML template standard has ubiquitous support. And then, uh, you know, there are a few areas, particularly on Firefox where, uh, and Edge, I guess, uh, where support for these standards is provided by polyfills. Uh, you know, these are, I've got a slide on this, but polyfills are, are JavaScript libraries that help uh, sort of enhance browsers. Uh, so they have the features you need. Uh, the uh, other than the module um, standard, uh, JavaScript module standard, uh, every uh, you know there's complete coverage across all these browsers uh, for all of the um, you know the elements of these um, uh, you know that make up web components. Uh, once you take polyfills into account. Uh, anyway, uh, polyfills, like I said, um, uh, polyfills are sort of important uh, JavaScript libraries. They implement modern browser APIs ahead of support for those APIs <coughs> within the browsers themselves. Uh, 
you know, the, the major browsers, all the browsers in this chart are, have implemented or are actively implementing support for all of the web components, um, uh, you know, specifications and standards we are discussing. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, where there are gaps, there are polyfills available to fill them. The most important polyfills are available from uh, the, you know, sort of web components group uh, in GitHub, uh, the web components group itself. Uh, and they, uh, on their own, they provide uh, sort of comprehensive uh, coverage across all of the standards we're discussing. Uh, you know, next topic, I need to say a few things about Node.js. Uh, in all of the previous incarnations of front-end development uh, content for uPortal, uh, the, uh, you know, the development of that content was essentially uh, Java-based. Uh, iChannels, you know, iChannel itself is a Java interface. It, it was uh, Java-based development that was done uh, to create iChannels. Uh, also in the case of both um, Java Portlet specification 1.0 and 2.0, uh, the you know those are Java specifications. So the, uh, the you know the the portlet components, portlet modules were developed uh, as as Java projects. And even in the case of of early Soffit modules, uh, those were primarily uh, those could be done in any uh, platform. That was one of the advantages. But they were and and are primarily uh, Spring Boot modules. So they're essentially uh, Java-based development. Uh, so the web components work that we've done is a, a significant departure in this way as well, because we are doing this work uh, in, in JavaScript sort of entirely. There really is no Java uh, component to a, a web component. Certainly there is Java, certainly we use Java for a server-side uh, APIs and access to data, uh, server-side logic that we use with our web components. Uh, you know, for our part, we continue to use Spring Boot for that. Uh, it seems to be an excellent match. Uh, but the the development of the web components themselves is purely, um, you know, a, a JavaScript, uh, you know, based projects, and we're doing those uh, with Node. And, uh, you know, the Node platform, uh, you know, it provides, it has sort of the largest ecosystem of, of pluggable libraries and modules uh, in the world. Uh, it, it has, you know, concepts like dependency management that, you know, as Java developers we are familiar with. Uh, and it provides, you know, the Node platform provides a significant tooling, you know, build processes and linting and and packaging and so forth, significant tooling for uh, front-end uh, development projects. Uh, and here are some examples of that tooling, uh, as, and as well as other libraries that we find, um, you know, sort of amazingly useful uh, for developing web components. Uh, I, in other presentations, I have a, a, a very sort of expanded view of this, but for this presentation, you should be, uh, I think, at least be aware of these. Uh, the Babel module, uh, the Babel module, it, it, it transpiles JavaScript. It's like a, compile, a compiler for JavaScript. Uh, but instead of converting Java code to Java bytecode, Java syntax to Java bytecode, uh, it converts modern JavaScript, uh, ECMAScript, uh, you know, 2015 or, or later. Uh, Babel transpiles modern JavaScript to Java, JavaScript that can be understood by all the browsers you're targeting. Uh, when you set up Babel, you can actually configure uh, which browser versions you uh, want to support in the JavaScript that it um, transpiles. Uh, Webpack is another very important node module. Webpack has the ability to take your, your node project, all of the elements of your node project, and, and assemble it into a single uh, JavaScript bundle. 
Uh, and this is very handy for us uh, because we use these projects as pluggable modules in uPortal, and you'll see an example of that shortly. But Webpack uh, produces JavaScript bundles out of your, uh, out of your JavaScript, but also out of your HTML and CSS. Uh, it can take all the elements of your project, uh, even even images. It can take all the em elements of your project and, and bundle them together into a single uh, JavaScript file. Uh, and then these last two, uh, React uh, Re React JS and Vue JS, uh, they're similar to to Angular. You may um, uh, be, you know, some folks on the call may be more familiar with Angular. Uh, they are popular JavaScript libraries for building uh, front-end applications. Uh, we, you know, at Unicon and, and the folks that we're working uh, most closely with in partnership, we have used and continue to use both React and Vue to build web components. Uh, I will say, uh, from my experience, the primary difference is this. Uh, React has a larger um, community and a, a larger library of uh, pre-existing modules. So if you're looking to build a web component by, by wrapping uh, a, a fancy module that, um, uh, you know, in open source that someone else has already built, you will probably find more modules to choose from uh, in the React space. But if you're looking to build a web component sort of from scratch, if you're looking uh, to build a, a more simple web component where you expect to uh, put together all of the HTML and, and the styles and the logic yourself, uh, Vue is an excellent choice because it's designed uh, from the ground up, it's, it's designed to be incrementally adoptable. Uh, so you can adopt the features of Vue as you as you learn it, as you learn them, uh, and um, it, it's sort of very easy to understand, easy to use, uh, and friendly to newcomers. Uh, and so, if we're not uh, if we're not building something sort of large and complicated, something like the form builder, uh, based on work that someone else has done that's available in open source, uh, we typically use Vue. Uh, last topic in this subsection, <coughs> web jars. Web jars are neat. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the idea of web jars is that you can take uh, client-side libraries, sort of front-end web libraries, and package them into a, a jar file, a Java archive file, uh, like, you know, exactly as uh, we as Java developers are familiar with. Uh, web jars are neat because they have a group ID. They can have a group ID, artifact ID, and version. Uh, they can be published to <clears throat> Maven repositories like Maven Central uh, artifact repositories. And from there, uh, they can be included in your Java projects like uh, uPortal Start uh, or, you know, or like FBMS. Uh, they can be in, included into uh, Java-based projects in, in Gradle or Maven uh, as standard dependencies uh, and, and pulled from uh, dependency repositories like Maven Central. So uh, if you build uh, web components, you should publish them, you should package them and distribute them as web jars because it makes uh, the process of incorporating them uh, into uPortal or other uh, or other web applications based on Java, it makes that process very easy. All right, which brings us to the next subsection: uh, using web components in uPortal. So I, I continue to see uh, no new questions in the chat. Uh, I think I'm going to charge ahead just to make sure I can get through all of this, but I do have a slide at the end for questions. Uh, if we if we don't catch them ahead of time. So uh, pr the previous section was really about uh, web components and working with Node and about and even about web jars in a general sense. Uh, and this section in this section we connect the dots with with those topics 
Uh, we connect those dots to uPortal itself, and we show you how, how these things are meaningful for uh, working in uPortal. So the first topic is, uh, is bundling a web jar into uPortal Start. And uh, based on a recent contribution that was in a pull request and, and merged, you know, perhaps a month ago, uh, that process is very easy. You can now add a, a web jar, any web jar that's available publicly in Maven Central, and uh, and npm actually makes um, you know. Uh, <laughs> Countless web jars available that way uh, by syncing with Maven Central. Uh, you can make any web jar uh, available in uPortal with with one line, uh, just by adding it as a dependency uh, to the uh, to the Overlays Resource Server uh, project in uPortal Start. If you if you look in there in your uPortal Start, provided it's updated in the last month. Uh, you will see there is a build.gradle file. The build.gradle file, you know, in a Gradle project, that's where dependencies are managed. You will see other dependencies there. I think, in fact, you will see this dependency there. Uh, and you have the opportunity to add more dependencies uh, that are web jars in uh, the resource server project in uPortal Start. And if you do, they will be available to use in uPortal uh, you know, once you build. Uh, final note on this topic, use, we recommend using the app jar uh, classifier for the dependency uh, in order to pull just the web jar that you want. Uh, if you don't specify the, the jar uh, classifier, uh, then Gradle will read the POM for, you know, the, the project metadata for that web jar and it will it will look at the dependencies for that web jar, and it will pull, uh, you know, potentially a large number of transitive dependencies for that web jar. And and sort of the point of web jars is that uh, once they are built for uh, deployment into a server, they contain everything they need. So those transitive dependencies aren't necessary. Uh, the, the transitive dependencies are not necessary uh, for bringing a web jar into uPortal Start. You know, so keep that in mind. Uh, this is how it's done. It's a one-liner. You can bring in any dependency that's in a Maven repo uh, that uPortal Start is is accessing. Uh, so once you have a web jar in uPortal Start, once it's deployed, uh, next topic: referencing a web component. Uh, on the portal page. Uh, this part is pretty easy as well. Uh, at this point, and I'll say a little bit about this, but at this point we're using simple CMS portlets uh, to bring uh, web components, web components in web jars uh, onto the portal page. And I'll show you um, an example of that in a minute. Uh, but if you it, but you have options. Uh, for one thing, if you need to, uh, I'm going to show you an example. You know, here it is. Uh, but if you need to have uh, HTML that is dynamic, for some reason dynamic, that brings in your your web component, you have the option of using a simple JSP portlet instead. Uh, I think you know many of you, most of you, are, are loosely familiar with how those work. Simple JSP portlets. Uh, are rendered on the server side, uh, and they do a bunch of classic things that we all know well. They have access to user attributes and groups, for example, as well as other configuration settings in the portal. Uh, if you need to build that HTML that brings a web component onto the, onto the page, you, if you need to build it in a dynamic way, you can do it with a simple JSP and have access to all those things. Uh, at this point, I'm not aware uh, of of even one place that we're doing it in the things that we have contributed to uPortal Start or the things that are on their way into uPortal Start. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not being necessary at all. Uh, so we are ex exclusively using simple CMS portlets for this. Uh, but I will add to that that down the line, you know, perhaps in six months, perhaps sooner, uh, I anticipate that we may uh, develop a, a, 
a, a CPD, uh, you know, a channel publishing document for, for those old timers out there who remember what these things are. Uh, I anticipate that we may put together a, a CPD or a specific workflow, uh, a specific, a, a new portlet type, uh, specifically for publishing a web component uh, that will streamline uh, this process even more uh, in terms of publishing web components. Uh, you know, reason being, I uh, ultimately I expect that the majority of content that in New Portal will be based on web components. You know, right now it's the minority, uh, but you know, things could be really different by the next Open Imperio uh, is certainly a year from now. Uh, things could be really different. We may get to the point where a majority of content is uh, web component based. And I think we will be looking to enhance the Portlet Manager, possibly even rename the Portlet Manager, uh, but we'll be looking to enhance uh, the administrative UIs for managing content in the portal so that managing so that managing web component based content is uh, much easier and more obvious. Uh, so I think those things are coming. But for the moment, for the present, uh, this technique works uh, tremendously well. Uh, you know, this is a, a code example. This is a snippet from a, a portlet dash publication dot XML. Uh, file. Uh, these files are records of, uh, you know, sort of portlet publication metadata records. Uh, and we have loads of them, of course. Every content object in the portal has one of these things. Uh, we mostly manage them through uh, import export and check them into uh, the, our Git repos, our ePortal start Git repos. Uh, but they can be managed through the portlet manager uh, in the portal, directly in the portal. Uh, this sample, this example illustrates uh, the, the new notification icon uh, web component uh, in uPortal. Uh, it, I don't have a screenshot of that. It occurs to me that that might have been useful in some other presentations I do. But if you update your uPortal start, and if you just look at sort of vanilla uh, quick start data set from Aperio, uh, one of the content elements that you'll see in there is the, um, uh, the notification icon. Uh, and this is the publication record for it. Uh, you can see uh, that in this case, we're pulling a, uh, a JavaScript file from the notification portlet. That JavaScript file is a web component. Uh, it's the notification icon web component. It has been uh, assembled with everything it needs, including uh, CSS uh, and including HTML. It has been packaged into a single uh, JS file by Webpack, essentially, and by Node. All right, next topic, uh, and I'll continue to attempt to move quickly. Uh, in these web components that are 100% static and, and do not render server-side at all, well, how do we know anything about the user uh, or about uh, the portal? How do we get access to uh, data you know, that is user-specific or, or protected? Uh, we do that with uh, OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. Uh, uPortal, starting with version 5.1, uh, I'll jump ahead real quickly here. Starting with version 5.1, uPortal uh, has a user info endpoint that will provide uh, an OpenID Connect ID token. Uh, this is a sort of standards-based uh, representation of the user's identity and, and access uh, to things in the portal. Uh, it, the ID token contains information about the user as well as, uh, you know, so user attributes, as well as, um, you know, the groups that the, uh, some of the groups that's configurable by you, uh, that the user is a member of. Uh, it's available uh, to any front end, any, uh, any front end component running on the page. Uh, it's available uh, at this slash user info endpoint. The full uh, URI is in the first bullet. 
Uh, all of the OIDC uh, Connect standard claims are, are mappable uh, to user attributes, to portal user attributes uh, through uh, configuration in Portal Home. Uh, custom claims are also uh, supported and also can be managed through properties in uPortal Home. Uh, there's one custom claim that is added by default, uh, and, and that's a custom claim called Groups. Uh, using the Groups custom claim, you can include in the ID token uh, information about what groups the user is a member of. It's not uh, it's not typically all groups uh, that uh, a user may be a member of. You you are sort of obligated to enumerate the ones you care about uh, for your ID token. Uh, the the reason for that uh, is well, on the one hand, it's so that you know you can manage security if that's necessary, but also because uh, we want to manage the size of this ID token because it's passed. Uh, in the HTTP header, and we know from experience that uh, growing without limits, uh, those headers, we can run into problems. So everything about the user info endpoint and the OIDC uh, connect uh, token uh, can be managed in uPortal.properties in Portal Home. Uh, so that's handy. Uh, when you are building a web component, I think all of our web components at this point use this module, uh, the, the, the uPortal web components project on, on the uPortal contrib uh, account within GitHub provides uh, a helper library called OpenID Connect, called, sorry, at uPortal slash OpenID Connect. Uh, and using this library, uh, you, it makes the process of consuming this ID token, you know, sort of fetching and using this ID token, it makes that process very easy and streamlined. Uh, in the top bullet, I have an example of adding this library to your node project, npm install. And uh, in the bottom bullet, I have an example both of fetching the token, that's the, the first line, you know, this await OIDC uh, business, that is uh, the JavaScript code, uh, the very modern JavaScript code that it takes to fetch uh, the ID token using this library. Uh, and then the, the remainder, the next line, you know, through to the bottom of uh, the JavaScript illustrates using the ID token to call uh, an API. Uh, you know, you can see it's a, a, a notification API. Uh, it's in a variable, but we need to pass uh, the ID token as, as a bearer token in the authorization header. Uh, when we invoke that notification API. And the new uh, REST APIs that we're creating, including uh, the ones in Form Builder, uh, all use this pattern uh, for authentication, uh, for security. So in a few lines here, uh, this slide illustrates the process of using this library, the at uPortal slash OpenID Connect uh, library, to handle accessing the ID token from uPortal and to use that token to invoke uh, a REST API. Uh, so that was client side in your node project. Server side, we also have libraries to help you. Uh, I mentioned at the be beginning of this section, I think, that we used the Soffit technology that we'd been working on with uPortal 5. Uh, with our web components, and this is how. Uh, the uPortal Soffit renderer uh, dependency, it's, it's a jar file uh, available uh, from uPortal. It's released uh, every time uPortal is released, um, you know, uPortal 5 is released. Uh, there is a um, uPortal Soffit renderer uh, library that you can add to your a uh, project that includes REST APIs for use with web components. If you add that dependency, you can add a configuration class, uh, you know, a, a spring configuration class uh, with enable web security. 
uh, I should say spring boot. This is entirely a, a spring boot example. Uh, with configuration uh, annotation and enable web security annotation, uh, once you have that class, you define a, uh, a bean, an authentication manager bean, based on the Soffit API authentication manager. And lastly, you define a, an abstract pre-authenticated processing filter bean based on the Soffit API pre-authenticated processing filter class. Uh, you define uh, two beans uh, using uh, Java Spring configuration style uh, in a class annotated with configuration and enable web security. And you can manage uh, <coughs> authentication uh, with the OIDC ID token provided by uPortal. Uh, Bruce Phillips asks, you know, why are we talking about Spring Boot if web components are front end? Uh, it's, it's a great question. The, the web components are 100% front end, but sometimes what you want to do is not 100% front end. Sometimes you want to teach your web components how to talk to a back end uh, so that you can bring data into the web components, uh, you know, data or provide access to, um, you know, teach your web components how to invoke services, back end services. Uh, and you can do the back end with anything you like uh, with the web components. Uh, that is fine and one of the real advantages of the new shift in, in how we're doing the front end development. Uh, but we, you know, in the community, in the, in the work that we do, we are primarily Java developers and we are uh, greatly familiar with Java for back end uh, implementations and we quite like uh, Spring Boot. Uh, so this slide illustrates how to set up a Spring Boot project to work with a web component uh, that uses this library. So on the front end, we have node and web components and a whole bunch of node mo modules like uh, Webpack and Babel. On the back end, we have uh, Spring Boot and REST APIs. Uh, and we use this library, the uPortal Soffit Renderer library, uh, to teach our Spring Boot project in, you know, very succinctly how to accept authentication from the front end web components we build. Uh, and so I've talked through that process, but that process of securing web, um, you know, REST APIs using these components, that process is discussed in much greater detail uh, at this URL in the uPortal 5 manual uh, with examples including fuller examples. So uh, please uh, feel free to refer there. Uh, and that brings us to our last section sort of um, just in time on Form Builder itself and FBMS. Uh, so Form Builder is a uh, you know a new web component. Uh, you know Form Builder and FBMS together are a new sort of you know module for uPortal, uh, developed in partnership between uh, State Center, Community College District, and Unicon, as well as uh, I should have added them to this slide as well, uh, as well as with uh, Cal Poly Pomona in partnership with. Uh, there are two GitHub repositories, uh, and the URLs for these are at the bottom of the slide. Uh, both uh, GitHub repositories are found in the uPortal Contrib uh, GitHub account. Uh, the one is Form Builder. That's the front end. It builds to a web jar <coughs> uh, web component. Uh, the other is FBMS. I'll mention that in this case, FBMS actually in, uh, includes includes Form Builder as a dependency directly, so you don't have to add you don't have to add uh, Form Builder to uh, the resource server module uh, as a WebJar dependency in uPortal Start. You just have to add FBMS. Uh, FBMS and Form Builder 
front end and back end, uh, we are using you know these technologies that I've already discussed and a few others that I haven't discussed. Uh, to build uh, these components, uh, all of the front-end components like uh, Node, uh, you know, ECMAScript, you know, modern JavaScript, uh, front-end components like Babel and Webpack, uh, we're using React uh, to build uh, our, our form builder web component. On the back end, we're using uh, Spring Boot, we're actually using Spring Boot 2. Uh, we're using Spring Security as well as uh, the uPortal Soffit Renderer module that I mentioned. Uh, we're also, <coughs> we have a few database tables for the FBMS module, so we're using Hibernate. Uh, we're also using Spring Data JPA. Uh, <coughs> so, Form Builder and FBMS, they allow you to define custom web forms to, to use in your portal, uh, custom web forms that you can display in your portal you, using only JSON schema without building um, sort of custom user interface components and custom backend components uh, using only JSON schema and using Form Builder and FBMS. Uh, you can publish new forms and update existing forms without without building or deploying your portal. Uh, it's all data driven. Uh, you can extend and integrate with FBMS easily using uh, you know by defining custom extension filter beams. I've got a slide on this topic coming up. Uh, using Form Builder and FBMS, you can if you want to, you can create a sophisticated workflow by chaining. Uh, forms together. Uh, Form Builder and FBMS, uh, well, primarily FBMS, includes API uh, documentation uh, and a simple REST client uh, through Swagger. You know, there's a Swagger client uh, for FBMS, uh, and I actually have a slide to show that. Uh, there is also uPortal import export support for FBMS. So if you define uh, web forms for use with FBMS, you can uh, include them as uh, a JSON file uh, in your repository, your Git repository, and when you build a new environment uh, or when you um, sort of update your production environment even, you can use import-export features to uh, roll out uh, or update web forms in your portal. Uh, and I should say, and I hope this comes across, that Form Builder and FBMS, it's not sort of merely a new web component. It's, it's sort of much larger than that. It really represents a sig significant constellation of new capabilities uh, for uPortal. We have, we have not previously had uh, a, a Form Builder uh, that we've been able to use uh, directly in uPortal. Uh, we, you know, those of us who have done that kind of thing have often integrated uPortal uh, with an external form builder sending users outside of the portal uh, to fill in, you know, sort of custom forms. Uh, this, you know, these components, these new uh, repositories, modules, they represent uh, a you know, sort of a large uh, body of new capabilities for uPortal. Uh, and I very much hope that uh, we will see, you know, several adoptions uh, and even some examples of using these these components in uPortal Start uh, over the coming, you know, six months or year, uh, because we need to highlight uh, the capabilities here because there are uh, a lot of them. All right, so quickly. I mentioned JSON schema. This is an example of JSON schema. Uh, JSON schema is like XML schema, except for JSON. Uh, JSON schema is itself JSON uh, that you use to describe other JSON. Uh, the JSON here uh, defines and constrains uh, the format and content of another uh, JSON document. So if you can define a JSON schema, uh, a chunk of JSON schema like this, uh, and import it into FBMS, you will have a web form. Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> a web form like I had a screenshot here, uh, you know, like these that can render in the portal uh, as a content object in uPortal. Uh, next topic, oh, geez, I'm right up against the end of the hour. Uh, you know, unless someone stops me, I'm going to carry on with content I have. I think I have about three more slides. Uh, you are most welcome, of course, to continue. Uh, I hope the recording includes it. I will additionally stay on for any, any questions as long as necessary. Uh, next topic, extension filter beans. There is an interface in FBMS designed expressly for for you or for me or for anyone to extend the capabilities of FBMS and in particular to integrate it with other systems. It's a very simple uh, interface. Uh, it's called extension filter. It has two methods. The first method applies to, allows you to constrain, allows you to, to, um, to you know, to instruct FBMS uh, concerning which operations uh, your filter bean uh, should operate over. The second method, uh, do filter, uh, allows you to implement custom logic that happens uh, whenever a, um, a REST API within FBMS uh, executes. Uh, these extension filters are very similar to servlet filters and portlet filters. Uh, there's a filter chain that decorates uh, decorates sort of the core CRUD operation at the heart of an invocation of a REST API in FBMS. Uh, you know, the, the extension filters are not really required uh, to run uh, FBMS in Form Builder, but they allow you to extend it and to get FBMS and Form Builder talking to other services that you have uh, and to insert custom logic. Uh, there is, uh, you know, I talked about chaining forms together to um, implement a, a uh, complicated workflow. You can do that with the form forwarding feature. I've got uh, form forwarding allows you to, allows you in an extension filter to send the user to a new form when he or she completes uh, a previous form. Uh, and, you know, that's done in Java code in an extension filter bean. And uh, I have an example here of how that's done. Uh, you need to get a reference. You need to obtain a reference to a, a form entity that you want to send the user to. And then you just call form forwarding dot forward. Form forwarding uh, is a it's a spring bean in the application context that you can auto wire into any other spring bean where you want to use it. Well, into a um, extension filter, which is also a spring bean. Uh, using form forwarding, you can chain forms together, uh, just a couple or several to create a complicated workflow. Uh, I mentioned uh, the Swagger client. Uh, there is API documentation and a simple client for exercising those APIs based on Swagger. Uh, it's available in FBMS, uh, you know, sort of out of the box. Uh, this is what it looks like. There are uh, REST endpoints for forms, form objects, as well as for submissions. Those are the two core types of entities in uh, FBMS and Form Builder. Uh, as, a, as an admin uh, or a sort of uh, content editor in the portal, uh, you define forms. Uh, these are the, you know, forms are, are, are forms that a user might respond to. Uh, once you define and publish a form, users, uh, you know, depending on the web components that you publish, uh, users have the opportunity to view and respond to those forms, and those responses are called submissions. So there are form entities and submission entities in, uh, in FBMS and Form Builder, and uh, the Swagger client allows you to view and manipulate them both. Uh, next topic, import-export support. You can do import-export either from a standalone clone 
of the FBMS uh, project. Uh, and there's, you know, the third bullet has uh, an example of invoking that from the command line, uh, you know, the boot run data init task. Uh, or you can invoke uh, the import export support from a, a bundled FBMS, and I, and I think this option will be, you know, vastly more common and popular. You can bundle uh, FBMS and Form Builder into uPortal Start. Uh, in a, a few months' time or less, I expect actually that FBMS and Form Builder will be bundled by default uh, in uPortal Start. And uh, with a bundled FBMS, you can use uh, the import export features to set up uh, the schema, the database schema, the tables that are necessary for FBMS, as well as import uh, forms, uh, you know, custom forms that you create. Uh, and, you know, this is uh, very reasonable import export support, very similar to things like the calendar module or the newsreader uh, in uPortal Start already. Uh, next topic, this is what bundling FBMS and Form Builder in the uPortal Start looks like, uh, similar to other modules. Uh, we, uh, you know, it's done in Gradle. Uh, you would do it in the, uh, within the overlays uh, subproject in uPortal uh, Start. Uh, we would apply, for the purpose of import-export, we would apply the Gradle import-export plugin. Uh, you see that at the top of this um, illustration. Uh, for dependencies, we need to bring in FBMS web app, you, you know, which is published in Maven Central. Uh, also, uh, for FBMS, because it has a database schema, we would typically apply uh, the JDBC configuration, which brings in JDBC drivers in uPortal Start. And then I've illustrated uh, below that, that bit under the comment custom components. Uh, this is how we might bring in an additional JAR file that implements uh, custom extensions to FBMS, things like extension filter beans. Uh, and then in uPortal Start, we have to define the archive name uh, that we deploy. And then I've got a comment at the bottom. Uh, there is uh, additional uh, Gradle configuration that is necessary for the import-export support. Uh, all of that is listed in an example in the README for FBMS in the, uh, the project in GitHub. Uh, please have a look. It's not very long, but it would be about two more slides at least. Uh, so the bundling process is really pretty simple. Uh, this is how you would bring it into uPortal Start and make it a part of your, your uPortal 5 deployment. Uh, this is my last slide. Uh, I list some next steps for FBMS and Form Builder. There are some significant uh, emissions, uh, which I think you'll recognize as soon as I say them. Uh, I've mentioned the stop bullet point already, but we intend and hope to bundle uh, FBMS and Form Builder into uPortal Start by default. Uh, you know, there will be a pull request. We will we'll identify uh, one or two, you know, relatively simple use cases, common, but relatively simple use cases uh, for FBMS and Form Builder. Uh, we will provide an example of, of those use cases and uh, in a pull request and, and ultimately uh, <coughs> bundle FBMS and Form Builder into, into uPortal Start. I don't know how long that will take, but, but perhaps, you know, a month or maybe even less. Uh, other significant uh, next steps for FBMS and Form Builder, and they are significant. Right now, the only way to get value out of FBMS and Form Builder is to use extension uh, filter beans and integrate them with other things. Uh, that's fine because that is, you know, that's perhaps the sort of primary, you know, long term, that may be. Uh, the primary usefulness of these components is uh, getting users to submit forms and then integrating those forms. Uh, you know, the, the user submitted data with other, you know, systems or processes on campus. Uh, you know, that's certainly a very good way to use these modules, but we would like to provide 
uh, I'm doing these bullets in reverse order, but we'd really like to provide an auditing UI. We'd really like to provide a web component based in the portal uh, user interface for viewing the submissions, you know, not just viewing, potentially sort of graphing and, and charting uh, the submissions that users have made, uh, you know, on a perform basis. Uh, it would be very nice to be able to view those things directly in the portal uh, using a, uh, you know, a, a user interface developed with the new stack, so a, um, a web component-based user interface. Uh, lastly, it would also be very nice to have a, um, uh, an authoring um, UI so that I, I wouldn't have to create JSON schema by hand. Uh, creating JSON schema, you, you can create, you know, quite a rich form with quite uh, a significant amount of behavior uh, by, you know, by writing a JSON schema document that fits on one screen, uh, you know, that fits on a, uh, on a single monitor. Uh, so the amount uh, of effort and the amount of uh, sort of coding work uh, that it takes to create a form using these modules is reduced uh, dramatically, uh, but it is still uh, very technical work uh, to create a, um, a JSON schema document. Uh, it's still, you know, something that it takes a, a skilled technologist uh, to do. We would very much like to provide, uh, you know, an, an author, authoring and admin UI. Uh, so that you could go into the portal itself and construct a simple form uh, by, you know, by clicking, you know, on some buttons or, or possibly some drag and drop, uh, and then publish that form uh, directly in the portal uh, without uh, using an import-export process. So uh, those are things, uh, you know, I, I expect in the future, and those are things, you know, I would be delighted to have the opportunity to work on uh, and expect, you know, to be involved with uh, down the road. So, great question about how uh, user responses to form fields are validated. There are two mechanisms. Uh, one mechanism is that uh, JSON schema actually provides uh, the ability to validate, to provide validation rules uh, directly in JSON schema, some amount of validation rules. Uh, the, it's not well illustrated in this example, but you can kind of see that the type is, is string. Uh, so validation code is the thing I'm asking for in this JSON schema document. I'm, I'm asking a user to provide an SMS validation code that I have sent in a text message to the user. Uh, you know, it's it's like a five-digit number. Uh, and I've specified that the type is, is a string. There are other types that you can specify, you know, like an integer or so forth. Uh, there, you also have the ability to provide uh, regular expressions uh, directly in the JSON schema. Uh, for how you know user input should be validated, and if you if you provide this sort of client side validation, uh, the form builder UI will you know directly in the client side validate uh, these inputs, and will provide user feedback uh, directly before the uh, before the form is even submitted. Uh, so that is method one, and it's pretty good. Uh, some things are, um, you know, some validation that you might want to do is uh, two would be impossible to express as a regular expression or in uh, the JSON schema in any other way. And you can do that kind of, you know, perhaps you need to, in order to validate the user's submission, perhaps you need to, to contact a database. Uh, you can do that kind of validation in extension filters. Uh, those extension filter beans, they have the opportunity when a submission is made, they have the opportunity to review the user's inputs and reject them. Uh, it's done by throwing, throwing an exception, a very specific type of exception. 
Uh, if you reject the uh, user's input, you also have the ability to provide, uh, you know, into a, uh, they're gathered into a list. You can emit a message, uh, and that message that you emit when you reject the user's submission will be added to, um, you know, displayed directly in the form uh, so that the user has appropriate feedback and knows how to fix uh, the submission. Uh, so there really are at least two methods for validating the user's input. Uh, I like the first method uh, for easy things. It's great because it can be expressed very succinctly in the JSON schema directly. It can be validated in the client side directly. Uh, but there are sort of very custom things or, or sort of heavier validation tasks that can't be done in that way, and there's a way to do those in the extension filters. All right, I have gone over by a full quarter hour. I hope you will all uh, forgive me. Uh, but I have at last made it to the end, and I am available um, and eager to respond to additional questions. Uh, so how about it, folks? Um, I am very happy with the number of connections, you know, the, the amount of people I see on this web webinar. I'd say it's very encouraging. Uh, certainly some of you must have some, um, some questions about this content. I know it has been very high level, uh, the content. There really was a lot of ground to cover. Um, it's a massive shift in uh, how the front end development is being done. This isn't the first time we've talked about it, but it really is a topic that we need to keep uh, kind of discussing and promoting because there's a lot of information to disseminate. Uh, and I will, you know, again at the end of the presentation, I'd like to remind folks that the Winter Summit uh, you know, for uPortal uh, to be held in balmy, well, balmy is the wrong word, it's not, uh, it's not humid, but uh, scorching, uh, you know, Phoenix, metropolitan Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, the winter uPortal summit includes essentially a full half day of, um, of technical training uh, focused on these met methods you know, focused on this style of front-end development for uPortal. Everything we know now and everything we know uh, by then, we will attempt to summarize in about three hours of content and put in your hands. Uh, you know, we it, it's very important, I think, that uh, folks get what they need to be successful. Uh, this is an exciting change. Uh, it sets us up. I, I hope that everyone can appreciate, you know, as much as it, it gives us new things to learn, I hope that everybody uh, can appreciate how this sets us up gorgeously for the future. We have leapfrogged uh, our, our, you know, sort of development paradigm entirely to uh, 2018, uh, both back end and front end at this point with uPortal 5, uh, our use of Spring Boot, and now with uh, web components and um, the node modules that we're using. Uh, Drew, you have any add... questions? All right, excellent. Let's see. What would the typical workflow be for a front-end web component developer? So uh, I'm glad you mentioned Vue. Uh, Christian Murphy, can I delegate you? Would you put? Would you post a link to the um, the the quick how-to? You know, the my first. Uh, web component in view because we have this documented. It's a part of the documentation in uPortal web components. I'm not uh, absolutely positive that that's the perfect place for it. I, I wonder if maybe the uPortal manual itself is a better place. But there, there is a um, there's a section in the documentation uh, about how to do this. And if you look at that, I think it has a number of commands. Basically, uh, starting a new node uh, project. Uh, well, the first obligation is to um, install or, or possibly update uh, your local copy of Node and um, NVM, which stands for Node Version Manager, uh, and NPM, which stands for Node Package Manager. Uh, you may, if you have these things but they haven't 
been touched for a while, you may you know find that you need to update them. Uh, but with those uh, tools uh, available, uh, you can follow a relatively simple workflow to start a new project uh, using what what's it called, like the View CLI in this case. Yes, the View CLI. So I have Christian Murphy with me in the room. You may hear an additional voice. It's not me speaking in tongues. Uh, View CLI three, Christian. What do you say? Yep, uh, View CLI three. Um, so at the time of this call, at least, um, this technology is really designed to be used with Node 10, which is the latest, um, View CLI 3, which is also the latest, and um, View version 2, which is the actual framework. Um, and the workflow here is pretty um, nice in Vue. It's um, once View CLI is installed, you just say, View, create whatever you want your component name to be. Um, it'll ask you a few questions about what technologies you want to use, and then it will build out a, a little repository for you um, to get started with, um, including like a local dev server where you can actually um, just write the component and see what it looks like as you type. Yeah, actually, that's an important point, and I didn't mention it, and so I'm really glad it came up. Uh, with this web components development, you really... Um, very often you don't have to have the portal running at all. Uh, you can work on the web component. I mean, there, it's, it's a um, standards-based uh, pluggable uh, component, front-end component for web application development. Uh, more often than not, you can work on the web component um, you know, independently uh, of the portal without even the portal running. Uh, and in node development, when you make a change to a source file and save, it's automatically reflected in the running uh, sort of demo server. Uh, so, you know, the development of these front-end components is lightning speed by comparison with portlets. I would say you might want to include a section here about how to package a web jar out of this and publish that, but... I mean that's going to be fairly important too. I think you're right. Uh, there is no in this in this stuff. There's no how to for how to uh, how to build your web component as a web jar, although it is included in the link that Christian Murphy sent. Yes. Uh, I can. Typically, there's a minor tweak. T typically, you send a flag to the build command in uh, in Node. Oh, okay. It's like a dash dash. Build my thing as a web jar, you know, or something like that. Or, or actually, maybe I'm thinking a web component. Uh, maybe it's both. Both things um, are helpful. So, for building the web component side in Vue CLI, the only thing that you change from standard view is you add a dash dash target web component, mm -hmm. and that just changes how it packages the output. Um, and then, if you want to put it onto a web jar, the easiest way is if you can make the code public. Um, publish the code to the Node Package Manager, and then web jars can mirror whatever's in um, Node Package Manager, and it does a little bit of automatic bundling to make that in a format that Java can easily consume. Gotcha. So, uh, in summary, if you if you publish your web component to npm, mm -hmm. uh, it can automatically be synced as a web jar to um, web jar repositories, including Maven Central. Yes. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Thinking of something else, and I lost it. I put the um, I put the winter summer slide uh, back up uh, on the display, and I hope you can all see it. Uh, the The dates are January 29th through the 31st. It's a Tuesday through a Thursday. Uh, you know, please uh, join us. Uh, last year's event was great. We expect this year's event to be even better. Uh, we uh, you are welcome to come uh, come early or stay late uh, as well. We will provide a place to sit down and an internet connection and uh, occasional company. True, that's a great yeah. place to uh, to wind up. Thanks to you. Thanks to Christian for your input at the end. There, that's been a very informative webinar, and I hope it encourages folks to attend the U Portal Winter Summit early next year. Uh, 
thanks to everyone who's attended. Thanks for your questions. Thanks again to our presenter. Uh, and this video will be on YouTube, certainly by the end of Monday next. So uh, thanks a lot and goodbye.